we meet in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Before we sing our first hymn, I'd like to welcome you to this morning service. Today we are marking Ascension Day, a key date in the church's calendar, when we remember that after the resurrection, Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples, but then he ascended into heaven, leaving them with the promise of the Holy Spirit to come. But at that point, he returned to his Father. And so today, we're going to start off by marking that in our opening hymn, Hail the day that sees him rise. All the words for this and for all the liturgy you join in with will be on the screen.
let's say together the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For all of us, we are very aware that we have fallen short, not lived to God's holy standard, but week by week we have a chance to come and be cleansed as we ask for forgiveness. So let's just pause a moment and then share together in an act of repentance. What God has prepared for those who love him, he has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything. Therefore, let us in penitence open our hearts to the Lord, who has prepared good things for those who love him. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, as God's forgiven people, let's join together in singing the Gloria. Glory to God the highest, and histories people on earth, Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father. We worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, Lord of the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Collect, or Prayer for Ascension Day. Risen, ascended Lord, as we rejoice at your triumph, fill your church on earth with power and compassion, that all who are estranged by sin may find forgiveness and know your peace. 
to the glory of God the Father. Amen. The reading is taken from the Acts of the Apostles. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught, from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over the course of forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, Alleluia. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised, so stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I wonder if you are one of the many, many people in these recent weeks who have found a new hobby, growing plants. Lots of people are getting into gardening, aren't they, and discovering the joy of seeing a tiny little seed develop into a seedling and then a full-grown plant. Maybe you're doing so with uh, a slight anxiety about the future, about fruit and vegetables and hoping to supplement your diet. Or maybe it's just finding pleasure in getting your hands dirty, handling something that's so very fragile and watching the transformation that happens day by day before our very eyes. Whatever your reason is, it's a good thing to do. I've planted some seeds too, and although I've been growing things for many years, it still thrills me to see the new life coming out of something that is so tiny and fragile and seemingly dry and dead. Well, I'm glad to say that my beans are making great progress day by day, but I can't say quite the same for my courgettes. There's not a lot of sign of life coming from my courgettes just yet. And I have to say, I'm a bit tempted to poke around in the soil and see what's happening. But of course, that wouldn't help at all, would it? And it would probably destroy them. I just have to be patient and wait. But waiting isn't easy to do. In today's gospel passage, there was a bit of waiting to be done. The time was 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, and he was about to be taken from them physically, the event that was known as the Ascension, which we marked on Thursday. And when you think about it, it had been a pretty tumultuous time for those disciples. They'd had three years of being physically with Jesus, listening to his teaching, observing his miracles, his healings. And then they were thrown into grief and confusion when he was suddenly crucified. And that heralded their first period of waiting, Holy Saturday, not knowing what was to happen the next day when he was to be raised from the dead. And over the 40 days that followed his res resurrection, Jesus appeared to them many times over, being physically present with them again and again, eating food with them, talking with them, just being around in their presence. But now, another momentous event was about to happen. Jesus was to be taken from them, and this would be the last time that they would see him physically. He promised that he would send the Spirit in quotes, not many days from now, but they didn't know exactly when that would be or what would happen. He simply told them that they had to wait in Jerusalem until it happened. But waiting isn't easy to do. Margaret Whip, who's a hospital chaplain, wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Grace of Waiting. And in it, she observed, we have come to see waiting as nothing more than a problem, a nuisance, an interruption in the stream of life, an irritating pause button that breaks the illusion of cheerful continuity and control. The idea that waiting is often necessary or occasionally valuable seems hopelessly old fashioned and unpopular. We're having to do quite a lot of waiting in this period. Waiting and not knowing. Information that comes to us is sometimes very confusing. Will the schools reopen or will they not? Will I be able to continue on furlough or will I lose my job? When will I be able to hug my grandchildren again? Waiting is painful because we're not in control it highlights our helplessness. We're dependent on others telling us what we can and cannot do. 
And when we've been used to organising and running our own lives, that can be really uncomfortable. But waiting doesn't necessarily mean inaction. As I wait for my seeds to sprout and for the seedlings to grow, there are tasks that I have to undertake right now, because otherwise all my efforts will be a complete waste of time. There's nurturing now and there's preparation for the future. So firstly then, there's nurture now. You will know as well as I do that plants need both sunlight and water to grow and to thrive. So my little seedlings sit in the balcony in the sun and every evening I get out the watering can and I give them a drink. Without that, they will shrivel up and die. But secondly, there's preparation for the future. There will come a time in the not too distant future when they'll be too crowded in these little pots. So I'll have to plant them out into something bigger. So I've bought a big bag of compost and I've been busy creating some planters because the garden centres were pretty empty by drilling holes in old freezer trays. So when the time comes to move them on to the next stage, I'll be ready. In some ways, it was similar for the disciples, I guess. Their waiting was not aimless, but it was purposeful. Luke's Gospel tells us that after, her Jesus had, after Jesus had gone from them, they returned to Jerusalem and were continually in the temple, praising God. This was a waiting of anticipation, of hope. Their worship in the temple was like the sun and the water for my little seedlings. It was their nourishment, their sustenance. It was what held them together and developed their faith, even while everything else around them had changed. Perhaps we can see our own time of waiting as an opportunity too. Not just to take up new hobbies like learning to bake or growing plants, but as an opportunity to deepen our relationship with God through worship, through prayer, through reading the Bible, through discussion groups. It was very good to hear Cheyenne say last week in her um, interview about getting together with other students, even though they can't get together physically, they got together on Zoom and they're studying the Bible together. And it was interesting to read a study this month by the Christian Relief and Development Charity Tear Fund that found that a quarter of all UK adults say they have watched or listened to a religious service since lockdown, which is a lot more than would normally be in church. And nearly half of all adults in the UK say that they now pray. Of course, some people's introduction to prayer might be as a cry for help, or perhaps as a thanksgiving for recovery or for life or for family. But whatever it is, why not take time during this waiting period to focus on nurturing your relationship with God? God who loves you and who is always with you. But the disciples had a practical task to do as well. They had to select somebody new to replace Judas, to make up the number of 12 again. So in the verses that follow on from our reading from Acts this morning, if you read on further in the chapter, you learn about how their selection process resulted in Matthias becoming the 12th disciple. They had to prepare for the future. They had to be ready for when the promised Holy Spirit would come among them. So I wonder if there are ways that God is speaking to you in this time of waiting, to us all as a church or as a nation, to challenge us about how we can be preparing for the future. What can we be putting into place now that will prepare us for life ahead? Because it's quite clear that life will simply not go back to how it was before. It won't ever be the same again. So now is the time to ask ourselves, what may God be saying to us about our priorities for the future?
for how we spend our time, for how we care for our planet and for the most vulnerable amongst us. Now is the time to prepare. In a few weeks time, I'm hoping to see an abundant crop of courgettes and beans and spinach and whatever else. But that will only happen if I do the necessary work of nurture and preparation now as I wait for them to grow. So let's use this period of waiting as a time to nurture our faith now, preparing for whatever the future may bring with the guidance and comfort of God's promised Holy Spirit. Amen. As a response to Reverend Leslie's sermon, let's say together the words of the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now come to our prayers of intercession which will be led for us today by Chris Hunt. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. As I pray after each section, when I say, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond with, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Loving God, in the same way that we are in a period of waiting during our annual rhythm of worship, so we're in a period of waiting at the moment in our daily lives, waiting to see how the process of returning society to a more normal rhythm plays out, waiting, perhaps with anxiety, to see whether there will be a second wave of infection that causes more uncertainty, and waiting to see how our personal and professional lives, our neighbours, friends, families and loved ones are impacted by the experience we're all undergoing. Lord, we pray that during this time of waiting and uncertainty, we find ways individually and together to find new joys in this world and new ways to serve you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our political, business and spiritual leaders who are having to make decisions that will affect many people and will have a profound impact on our lives. We pray that you guide them in making these decisions prayerfully and thoughtfully, recognising that there may be no perfect answer, but helping them to chart the best course through these turbulent times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our local community and all its constituents. We pray for those among us who are working as doctors, nurses and caregivers, as they provide much needed physical and spiritual care for the ill, the elderly and the needy among us. We pray for those who have lost their job or are worried about their jobs. We pray for our children whose lives are being direct, disrupted and who may not fully comprehend the reasons for this change. We pray for our vicars and the broader community of clergy seeking to do your timeless work in new ways. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for each other, the family and community of St Andrews, gathered together in these prayers. We pray that you will help us support each other. We pray that you will help us remember that each of us has joys and sorrows, hopes and anxieties that are unrelated to the current situation. We ask you to help alleviate our sorrows and anxieties and help us to hold these joys and hopes close to our hearts as we wait for your will to become clear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we bring to you those known to us who have asked for our prayers. In particular, we pray for Majed and May Nadja and family, and for Colvin Fit. And we remember those who have recently died or those whose anniversary of death falls around this time, especially Sheridan, Frank Davidge, and Stephen Davidson. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. We join our prayers with the prayers of Mary, saying together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to share in the peace those of you in family groups share with one another and for all of us in our hearts may we share the peace that has been given to us. God has made us one in Christ. He has set his seal upon us and as a pledge of what is to come has given the spirit to dwell in our hearts. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to set before you, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to set before you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. 
The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give you thanks, almighty and eternal Father. And in these days of Easter, to celebrate with joyful hearts the memory of your wonderful works. For by the mystery of his passion, Jesus Christ, your risen Son, has conquered the powers of death and hell, and restored in men and women the image of your glory. He has placed them once more in paradise, and opened to them the gates of eternal life. And so in the joy of this Passover, earth and heaven resound with gladness, while angels and archangels and all the powers of creation Sing forever the hymn of your glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes here. Send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again he praised you, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms and bring us with St Andrew, St Mary and all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Rejoicing in God's new creation, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. 
Eternal God, giver of love and power, your Son Jesus Christ has sent us into all the world to preach the gospel of his kingdom. Confirm us in this mission and help us to live the good news we proclaim through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and, and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. This morning, um, I'm delighted to introduce you to Peter and Sandra Fuller, who I've known for quite a long while as we've overlapped at St Andrews, but this is a chance for you all to get to know them as well. So can we start off? Peter, Sandra, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourselves? Yeah, good morning, good morning everybody. Yeah, good morning, good morning. Well, Sandra and I have been married um, 49 and a half years. Oh, in fact, party coming up. It's an anniversary of our engagement tomorrow, uh, and we got married in October. Uh, so we, we have our fiftieth wedding anniversary this coming October. Uh, we have two children, Joseph and Yvette, and four grandchildren, aged between thirteen and twenty-one. Uh, so they're uh, 
getting rather big now, but we, we are so, certainly missing them because they've always been a big part of our lives um, at the moment. Um, I worked for London Underground for nearly 40 years. I started as an apprentice uh, and then went on when I retired. I was uh, engineering manager in charge of the Metropolitan Line train maintenance. Mm. Um, and I was lucky, really, to be able to retire at the age of 56. Uh, mm. and, and then I started working part-time as a gardener and premises manager for Lycon Armshouses, where I still work today. So, um, so Sandra will tell you a little bit about herself now. Well, I worked in medical oncology at Charing Cross Hospital for over 30 years. Um, I'm now helping my sister-in-law who runs an old age pensioners, I shouldn't call them that I suppose, elderly people's coffee morning. <laughs> and uh, we do it um, voluntarily and she makes bacon sandwiches and that and I'm usually the waitress because some of the ladies are in their 90s. And it's really nice for them to get out to our community hall because they live on their own and they're quite lonely, so they're missing our clubs. Yeah, so you go around with about four people at the moment? I'll go round and visit. I'm, I'm not supposed to, and I stand as far away as I can, but the 99-year-old can't hear very well, so I go and sit the other side of the table with her. Yeah. But um, it's really good. We live up by the Apollo in Hammersmith, yeah. so it's a, quite a big estate. We've actually always had quite an affinity with St Andrew's churches, actually, because um, Sandra's mum and dad got married in St Andrew's, Fulham Fields, back in 1935. Oh. I was brought up in Ham, which is between Richmond and Kingston, and I was a member of St Andrew's Church over there. When we were looking for a new church, it was my job, so I went round to about eight different churches, um, some of them were quite small. I got baptised at Tasso, just along the road from yeah. St Andrews, because I lived in the little houses that were down Field Road before the flats were built. So we moved out of there when I was 20. But Tasso was always like my home church. But some of the churches were too big and very impersonal. Um, people didn't seem to talk to you. But when I came to St Andrews, after trying about eight, I found it was so friendly and everybody was nice. And I walked in and I spotted Jeanette. Her daughter used to go to school with my Yvette. So Nicola and Yvette were friends. And that's how I started coming to St Andrews. And but we really enjoy it. Love it. We've only been coming about two and a half years. Well, I've been coming a little bit longer than Peter. But um, it's really lovely. Yeah, we enjoy it. I've made a lot of friends there. And you've been doing a brilliant job, I, I know, from visiting one or two people, which has been really appreciated. Yes, yeah. 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 So, we do our best. How, how have you found the experience of lockdown? What have you found hard and what have you, what have you maybe found something good in it that you didn't expect? Um, it's been very peaceful, it's very peaceful. We, our house is usually full of people, um, you know, either family or friends and things like that. We're always having visitors, so it's been very quiet, which is something we've had to get used to. But we uh, do argue a little bit. But it's a reverse, <laughs> it's a reverse argument these days. Whereas before I used to say, it's your turn to do the washing up, now I say, I want to do the washing up. <laughs> <laughs> Have you felt that it affected your your walk as a Christian? Has it changed uh, anything in that? I seem to feel more caring. I've got some neighbours who've got problems. You know, I've got a lady with really bad arthritis and that. So I do try to make time and I make lots, lots more phone calls. I really don't like phoning people, but with this lockdown, it's the only way to get in touch. Yeah. Are you? I think we've, uh, you know, from a personal, our personal point of view, um, we've always had a very strong faith. So uh, I think really that hasn't changed at all. If, if anything, it's got stronger. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. We think God is with us all the time anyway, and he will protect us and he will do what's right for us. He guides us all, all the time. That's brilliant. I, as I say, I, I knew something about you and have had conversations with you over the last couple of years, but I found out a whole lot more. So thank you. And it's really good to get to know you better and for everyone else to get to know you better. So thank you. Okay. Yes, we're quite all right. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Sandra and Peter. It's really good to see you and uh, to hear from you as well. Great to have you as part of the community, the family here at St Andrews. Just a couple of things to say before we close is that next week we will be celebrating the Feast of Pentecost together with the church all over the world. And uh, we hope for that special service to have a guest preacher. Um, so do join us at 10 o'clock next Sunday morning for Pentecost Sunday. And then there have been some birthdays around this time, so it would be good to celebrate those with those who are celebrating. Um, last Thursday, it was Beatrix's birthday, so happy 10th birthday to you, Beatrix. And uh, tomorrow it will be Marcia's birthday, and on Tuesday it will be Dion's. So let's join together in wishing them all a happy birthday, Beatrix, Marcia, and Dion. So before we sing our final hymn, which will again be led by members of St Andrew's Choir, let's ask for God's blessing on our day, on our week that lies ahead, and on all those whom we love. The Spirit of truth lead you into all truth, give you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and strengthen you to proclaim the word and works of God, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. <laughs>